Hello. Huh? Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no. No. Hello everyone, uh, here's the last free poster, if you want somebody, and his stickers, also free, if somebody wants. Uh, well, now please welcome Siddharth. Thank you. Um, so, I'm Sadar Sharma and I work for the Red Hat product security team. Yeah. Now? Yeah. It's much louder. Okay. So, um, I work for the Red Hat product security team. 
So title of my talk is Tactics of Code Auditor and it's about uh, the code auditing is something which cannot be really taught. It's by time. Uh, it's like how much time you devote in reading code and doing stuff with it. So I'm going to share some of my experiences that I, uh, like I've been auditing code for past two years now. And uh, <clears throat> so th that, uh, that's what I'm going to share, how I do it. And I don't say it, it's like uh, the complete um, thing. People can actually implement on uh, like their own techniques and stuff. So here is uh, the agenda uh, for the talk. And I'm not going to talk about it, just we'll go with that. So, what does code auditing look uh, look like? It's actually the fort in India. Uh, it's pretty uh, amazing. If you see, uh, this fort was built quite quite long time back, and uh, the fun part with this fort is uh, when the tides are high, this fort is uh, like the water will be here, and you cannot go walking. You go uh, through boats or any uh, any other means that walks on um, that moves on the water. And when there is a low tide, you go by horses or uh, the other means of the transport. So what I want to say here is it's like the source code of, or the application is same like this. Uh, if you put your application into different environments, it would have uh, different type of vulnerabilities. It, it, would, it can be attacked differently at uh, like the architectures, the way uh, the uh, the application is running at the moment. So yes, uh, it's pretty much uh, the same thing. You have a back door in the fort. You have known flaws. You have unknown flaws. There are guards which you want to tackle them. So the scope of the audit, it's like uh, many developers or like I, I work for the team where we have customers who are internal to the Red Hat. Uh, sometimes we get um, like the customers who use Red Hat products. They say, we want to buy this product, but um, what, what's the proactive effort that you are putting it into uh, the code audit or uh, of the application? Many developers would ask, OK, we have implemented this uh, feature in the application, and uh, we want to. Uh, we want uh, someone to look at it, um, like there, mi there might be some vulnerability, or not in terms of the open source or the Red Hat, but uh, like people who are the freelancers, they can go for the bug bounties and zero days. We all see that. A lot of times, uh, um, like the program managers of the product or uh, different uh, people involving the product. They'll say, OK, if you, even if you find the low or the more moderate uh, vulnerabilities in the code, uh, just tell us, we'll fix it. So uh, when you start auditing code, it's really important to understand like what you are looking for. There, there might be like your customer wants only uh, the vulnerabilities. Th those are critical or important to them, and they just don't care about like the lows and moderate, so you don't report them. So uh, this is pretty much the methodology uh, that I that I use. It's when you are looking for the um, particular application, you should you should really look at the documentation. Exactly the same version of the documentation, which applies. Uh, to the source you are auditing, because that's really important. And most of the times in the documentation, you are going to see um, like comments, or um, even in the code, you can see the comments from the developers saying that, OK, we have not implemented this feature, but this is really important. And um, then you know where to look at. The other thing is I, I haven't tried it, because most of the developers like live outside, or like I don't 
talk to them in the real world. Uh, it's like uh, you talk to developers. You, when developer is really drinking, you should go and ask them. They might spill the beans. Like they have this problem in their code, and you wouldn't know. Yeah, this is something which we need to look at. The <clears throat> other thing is, if the if the if the source code that you are if the, if the application you are going to audit. Uh, it has been in the community for a long time. Um, you, you should see uh, like what the other uh, like the people in the communi uh, community are saying about it. They might have some ideas. Okay, we think this could be the security flaw in this application, but no one knows it. So you have some some idea like you, you uh, some boundaries where you can start thinking of it. There is an idea, and then you start developing uh, the thing that, yeah, how you are going to order that. The other important part is if there is an application, you should really know there could be like million lines of code in it. So you should, uh, if you are able to get the blueprints of the application, like how it works, uh, like what is the architectural design of the application. You might not want to look at the backend, uh, like whatever it's getting stored in the database, but rather uh, the modules or the other places in the program where where the user is getting in, uh, feeding the input to the application. So you can literally cut down uh, the areas where uh, the places where you are going to see or look through the code, because in no way you are going to uh, like people can uh, order one million lines of code or like larger than that in a week or two weeks, it's not possible. So <clears throat> this is like, um, I'm just taking example of the Ceph. Like this is the architecture, how it works, what's there. So you get some idea like how, how you want to um, audit the code, where, where are the places where you want to look. For example, if there is some network thing, or uh, maybe at the places where the cryptography is used, or the places where, where, the, uh, where there should be the uh, like really secure channel uh, in the data, and the developers have not implemented it. So those are the uh, good places to look at in the code uh, to find out the vulnerabilities. Yeah. The, uh, Yes, so like why the application was written, who are, the, who are its users, it's also uh, really important because if there is any daemon that is going to run as a root and uh, there is no, like not much users, but it's a daemon, then you, you see things like uh, if daemon escalates privileges, like get UID or set UID, and uh, there are place, uh, places in the code where it doesn't drop it properly, so you might have uh, you might want to look at those places in in the code as well. So basically, you should have some high-level view of uh, the application, um, where um, you can think in the boundaries where an attacker would would be looking at. Uh, yes. Like authentication, information disclosures while logging data. So this is this is also really important. For example, a lot of places uh, in the application where developers enable the debu debugging logs, and uh, the debu debugging logs get shared with the other people, or they might load it to any public places that can have password, IPs, a, a lot of places. So. Uh, this is also one of the important parts for the information disclosure, uh, like how, how, it's, how the application is logging data, especially the debugging logs. And the crypto failures, um, yes. Also, just, uh, just not by looking at the source code, but it, it's also important when you compile uh, source code. Um, compiler will throw up a lot of warnings. Like when we build the RPM, uh, RPM packages, you can see the RPM build logs. Uh, what's gone wrong over there? It might 
Uh, so there's some places where the code was uh, not properly written. And so you get some ideas about the application or the code. So I'm basically going to talk about the C and C++ vulnerabilities here, uh, like the common type of vulnerabilities in the code where people can actually see them. Uh, see them. Um, so the first one is the buffer overflow, then the data types, and the miscalculation or the bad logic that happens in the code. Uh, predictable file names. For example, in the terms of the, uh, the buffer overflows, um, these, are, these are caused by the bad APIs. You can see mem copy and um, str copy and things like that. You can just, oh, in, in such a, uh, situations, what I usually do is I just grab these functions, just uh, throw, throw them at the source code, and if there is something that uh, it shows over there, I don't have to use a like, lot of tools, different tools to do that. So if you see these, these things, you can just directly just log them into your audit report and say, OK, this needs some change. But usually, these are not really very critical vulnerabilities now, nowadays. Uh, yes. The other thing is, um, long time back, if the code is using uh, any, any string functions and you don't import the string dot h, uh, there are completely a lot of security checks that uh, those miss in the code. So while compiling also, for example, the 45 source will not work. Uh, it, it will not have the secure, uh, proper security checks. And if you have a overflow or any uh, format string attack over there, it, it's just maybe the application just won't crash, and you, you, you will get an overflow over there. Also, it is important uh, while compiling the code, you use the D45 source with the optimization flag, because if you don't use the optimization, then also just 45 source doesn't work. But uh, in our RPM builds, we make sure uh, that that's enabled by default. So in terms of the uh, like buffer overflow, um, it's the classic buffer overflow that happens all the time in the code. If you can see, there is an um, argument that goes directly into the sprinter. And you can, you can actually see a lot of places in the code where, where the user data directly gets into the, these functions. So these are one of the places where, where you should look at, like from where the source is coming and from like what is the source and where it is writing to. These are also some of the examples that you will find in it, uh, find in the code. For example, uh, sometimes developer doesn't uh, thinks about the null termination of the of the string, so you get an off off one off by one byte error. And uh, below is the code how you fix it. Like you calculate uh, the string length is not greater than the buffer minus one. That is for the uh, like you you calculate the uh, null string at the end, and that's how you return it. But basically, those are, those are places where like, you can look in the code for the overflows. So the next are the data type flaws. Uh, these are different on the different architectures you are working on. For example, uh, the x86 or ARM or any, any other architecture, it would be different because the data type handling or the size of the data type would be different. So integer overflows are associated with it. It's like signed and unsigned data types, uh, which have m like major problems in that. You will see a lot of places uh, developer uses size t. And size t. So size uh, t is like the unsigned data type, and SIST is the signed data type. Now, 
how many people know here uh, like how the signed and unsigned is, is there anyone who doesn't know that okay like how what is the difference between the signed and the unsigned data type like everyone knows here right yeah so <clears throat> there are a lot of places like uh, the sist uh, signed data type is not uh, said to be used but there 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 are actually some of the places where where you will find like developers do this common mistake uh, and you can see in this code it uses size t and then this is the user data and the length that goes into some check and that returns minus 1 now that goes into the size and what happens is it's returning minus 1 but this is the unsigned type so it's going to wrap and this uh, there will be very large value that that's going to be stored in the size and this statement will always be false so it won't hit here though there was a security check done uh, it returned minus 1 on error but here it's never going to check because it just wrapped and now the size size has the positive value and it will escape this code and then you have like boom 4 gigs of memory allocation so that's how like uh, it's tools complement how how things work that's 32 bit sign it's like uh, the first bit is used for uh, to store like negative values or what but so <clears throat> this is this is uh, the common problem like you use the unsigned value and the maximum value it can store is like 255 and in some logic it adds one to it now it will it will be like zero now the overflow bit in the processor is set uh, but it's checked nowhere so it's it's pretty much common mistake in the code that happens the same applies to uh, the signed variable also if you add one to it it becomes minus 128 This is also bad code. Can anyone tell me like what's the problem in this code? <coughs> yep, you get a muffler. So should I give it now? It's here. So yeah. there is some more bad code. Anyone? And, uh, this one was actually, yeah, I can actually show you. This is from one of the CVs that we have. actually hear what the problem is it's 
Ah, yeah, I don't know why it's so bad, but okay. I can. So basically, uh, what it's expecting, it's a four, uh, the function is expecting the four digits. But what happens is, as soon as the PID goes up one, uh, there is an overflow, and that becomes this FFF uh, here. After this operation, it becomes one zero 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 zero, and it overflows. So, like these, these are pretty uh, common errors uh, that you can look in the code. Now, uh, a lot of places, this is actually from uh, the Python code, but yeah, a lot of uh, Python or a lot of places uh, in C, C++ programs, and maybe it would be relevant to any other program also, that they are writing to the temp directories. Now, if there is a daemon, who, uh, a daemon which is working uh, and using the temp directories, and attacker has access to it, they can actually use the, they can just swap it with the malicious code over there, and whenever the daemon again reads, and it's going to execute, and you get pretty much a root. If it's daemon, it's working, it's on the root privileges, you will get it. The other thing is, sometimes uh, it, it doesn't depend uh, mostly on the source code, but how it is shipped to the customers, because, for example, when you create RPMs or just uh, the mechanism like to deliver uh, these updates to customer, it also depends on the way you have uh, packaged it. So for example, if there is a post install script which is using this, that's bad. It also happens in the spec file. So you just leave the boundaries of the source code as well. You, you, the code auditor as in like has to take care about uh, things how this is going to be delivered to the customer as well later. Because suppose if this is an RPM and you are like internal user, you can just wait and you'll know when your admin is going to update uh, the RPM. You can just change this. You can add sudo your name. And RPM uses the root privileges to install on the system. So when, whenever RPM is going to install and do the post install script, done. <coughs> About the tools, uh, source code browser, yeah, everyone uses it. I use Cscope just to see some of the functions, how they are getting called to and fro. Um, it, because if you are running some of the static analyzers, they, they will say this is the function that you, you need to look at. But then you go into the function and you see like how the values are coming from the other function to this function or how uh, the input uh, is coming to this function. So I just use C, uh, like Cscope or some other tools uh, to see how the functions are getting called from, from the start of the main function. So you actually backtrack. You have a place that static analyzer showed you. Then you backtrack to, uh, to the place and see how things got manipulated in between, or if they can be. 
So some of the fast things are like uh, you can use uh, CPP lint or flow finder or CPP check. CPP check is good. Uh, it it shows quite a, a lot of um, problems. And there is uh, this post memory corruption memory analyzer. Um, it's on the GitHub. Um, if anyone wants, I, I'll share the link. Um, you can pretty much uh, run the program and attach the PID to this. So whenever the program is going to crash, it is going to analyze it automatically and will tell you most of the areas or the regions where uh, things were executable on the stack or the heap or wherever. The other, <clears throat> the other part are like the sanitizer. So th this is also important in terms of the code audit because developer, uh, like the code auditor can spend a lot of time uh, reading the source code and it's get, it gets frustrating uh, not to find anything over there. So what I usually do is I just compile uh, the source code with the address sanitizers and I just run them. And whenever there is some corruption or anything, it, it, it just uh, tells where exactly uh, the corruption happened and you can just go back and op fire up your uh, source browser and then you can look at the code where it happened. So it's, for me, like code auditing is not only like one way, it's from the other way as well. And then <clears throat> there are fuzzers, but that, that is like pretty much the pen testing that people do. But yes, as a code auditor, if you can do that, it, it's good. It helps uh, you track down uh, the places which, which might have been left in the code audit. So about the sanitizers, um, there is this lib asan. If you are using Fedora, you can just install libasan, and it works with the GCC. You can just compile it with uh, f sanitize equal to address flag, and it will set it. So address sanitizer can uh, pretty much find these use after free, double free, buffer overflows, and uh, such type of flaws. And there, there is another library in the Fedora called libtsan. Uh, you can just put flag f sanitize minus minus f sanitize equal to thread. And then <coughs> the thread analyzer will come into the picture. And it, it checks for the race conditions and the deadlocks. So these are good. About msan, I don't think so. There is a package available in Fedora. And so just tracks for the uninitialized memory. So also, as a code auditor, you, um, like we use CVSS2 uh, in the product security also at the moment for analysis of the flaws. But as a code, uh, code auditor, you can, you can use these things to actually identify the impact of the vulnerability or you have found. Um, like XX, uh, XS vector, uh, it's how you are able to get into uh, the program. Um, it's based, uh, it's a local, uh, it's, a, it's on the local machine or the adjacent network like on the VPN or the intranet, or uh, it, it's some kind of a daemon that you, uh, you are able to access uh, through a network. So it just use these values and uh, there is a, uh, CVSS2 calculator, which will show you um, the impact of that. So this is pretty much, anyone has any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, yes. Is, so, when you find something like this, do you also try to uh, change the way the project is built so that it will be able to find it? Hmm. 
Hmm. Actually, uh, like I have not dealt with most of the developers like that. Just uh, we say like this is the flaw. That's it. But uh, nothing like that. But yes, the same thing is uh, uh, if you see the build logs of any project, um, the compiler would be able to show that. But uh, the most important thing is if these are built on a system where no one is looking how it's building, it's going to mess it. Sorry? Well, treating errors. Yeah. Yes, it should be. Kind of like the goal of everybody's job should be like our job, should be to automate our results out of our jobs, right? So I'm wondering if you just try to look for these things and fix them one by one, or if you have like higher level agenda. Yeah, uh, so there, there are like some of the things. I, I showed you some of the uh, like the classic things or the functions. What if, so when we say don't use band API to our developer, uh, then developer can actually write his own band API at some point. Like not to use those functions and do something like that. And then compiler won't um, show any warnings like that. Like, for example, the string copy or any, which were like band APIs. A lot of people might write on their own C code just to do that, which is like more bad. Now, uh, uh, the job of the auditor has become more difficult because now tools are not showing that. Any more questions? And how much time do you spend on and how big um, rounds can be hmm. I usually spend my Fridays on it. Yeah. Because actually after the contract you're talking about I I read a thing watches years and years ago in the back of the book of the They say that after an auditor is working for like two hours on a piece of code, they almost never find anything after that form. Yeah, Tiger, you should know when to leave, when to give up on, uh, on something, and then maybe it's not your day in front of the uh, the code that you are auditing. Maybe the next day you might come, huh? Yeah, because it's really frustrating. You can. It's not something you know beforehand, like your manager or a anyone will not come to you and say, you have to find 100 flaws in this source code, now find it. Maybe there is nothing, maybe uh, it can also skip the eyes of the auditor and that's why uh, the, uh, there is more usage of uh, things like the address sanitizers and the things which missed uh, the audit, but again, then auditor can go back uh, and see things like w what were the problems and then go back and look at the code again. How much do you use cover in hmm. Like a lot of, uh, I guess, I guess, I don't know about that. Um, a lot of RPM packages have, uh, they use coverity, but I, I, I basically don't use that much. Uh, for me, yeah, static analyzers are good, uh, but there, there are a lot of false uh, positives in the static analyzers, and if, if it is going to give you like 4,000 places in a million lines of code to check, it's completely not possible. So the only way is like you run uh, the application, you poke it several ways, you see where the crash was and then you try to match where the static analyzer said it was important. And then you can see uh, some link between those two places. Then you know exactly where to look at. Like you, 
in auditing, you cannot start from the main function, right? Int main, and then you start from where it is coming. It's long, long way. How often do you actually use fuzzers? Hmm. Fuzzers I use uh, very rarely, very, very rarely, because uh, fuzzing is completely different world. Uh, and there are like lots of fuzzers. Today, if you go and see, there are lots of fuzzers. And yes, it's a bit difficult, but I, I usually do the classic ways of uh, exploiting. Okay. I, I, I usually use my classic ways of exploiting that, that used to be done before the fuzzers were there. Just send some crap into the system and see where it crashes. But that's what fuzzer does it for you, like doing the permutation and combination of different type of uh, things. But yeah, sometimes it, it's a bit difficult uh, to use fuzzer in some projects. Yeah. No. So do you have any criteria with which you, you select projects that are possible? Hmm. So for example, I, I work particularly in storage. Uh, I, I look at the storage security for the Ceph and the cluster. And uh, for me, the important areas are there. But there's like. Uh, vast number of people working on like different products, so they they will have different type of uh, approaches to their own products. For me, it's uh, for for the storage only. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Thank you. Ah. That's, oh, I guess no one wants this. <laughs> so mufflers are here, we can take it. May I have a question? My question is pretty silly. Yeah. Because I'm pretty new. No, no, no. First it's of all, because I was, uh, okay, uh, when I was learning programming, usually yeah. Have to uh, name uh, variables and files uh, which uh, with the uh, names that uh, is recognizable. Mm -hmm. But you offered to uh, uh, name files in uh, unpredictable way. Why? Yes. It's because, uh, okay. Mentioned Valgrind, so the ASN, oh, okay. ASN is like this uh, similar, maybe better. So um, with, oh, the Valgrind, that... uh, with the Valgrind, the problem is because that's a runtime thing, and the application becomes really slow. So, so sometimes it affects it. 
But yes, it does have a lot of flaws like the memory best flaws. But in terms of the address sanitizer, it's like it's it's at the compile time. It just puts the check at the compile time. No, but still you have to run it, no? With the ASAN. You just compile it with the ASAN? And then I have it with ASAN, no? Yes. You just compile it and run it? Yes. So that's it. Presentation. Oh, oh yes. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. I had demos too, so but there was one. I'm sorry, just give me a Thank you, thank you so much. You work at Red Hat? Request, huh? You work at Red Hat or? No, I don't work on Red at Red Hat. Oh. Oh, okay, okay. I will request for literature because I started to. I was interested. I started with uh, some kind of very serious book, and it's, it was like. The same. Uh, my name and. Siad. Siddharth. Siddharth. Yes. Is it S? Siddharth. Yeah. Ah, okay, it's D. I'll. I'll all right. <laughs> okay. So I I will write it to you <laughs> right now. Ah, <laughs> Thank okay, you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.